Hello everyone and welcome back to Spider-Man Dissembled. I'm Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Welcome back and thanks for listening. We're next going to cover three short little interlude pieces. I don't know where these fell in the actual issues. I assume they must have been like maybe at the end of each of those first three issues. No idea in the trade. They're just put in between the two three-parters. Park Avenue Interlude by Mark Guggenheim and Greg Land. Basically, this is just three or four pages following Jackpot uh, chasing after some dude. I don't really have much to say about this, except I still like Jackpot. It seemed like the entire point of that Jackpot story was just to remind you that A, she existed, B, she has the standard set of superhuman powers, there's nothing really new or exciting there, and C, gasp, she might be MJ. Dun, dun, dun. And I like Greg Land's artwork. A lot of people say all of his women look the same. I think that's true to an extent, but he does really good costumes and backgrounds and blah, 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 blah. So I can always tell them apart and their facial expressions are well drawn. So who cares? I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. And you know, this story features one woman for three pages. So no mistaking her for anybody else. Now I don't have a huge problem with Land either, though oddly I do think his earlier stuff with CrossGen was better, but you know, it's all right. In general, as long as it's not Ramos doing the art, I usually don't mind mind who the artist is. The Astonishing Aunt May by uh, Bob Gale and Phil Winslade. So it's just Aunt May at the feast thing and she tricks like a rapper dude into like giving them money. It, it, at least they're trying to do something with Aunt May. I guess. I, I, I just don't care. She's still dead as far as I'm concerned. I think this whole thing is kind of stupid with her being alive, but whatever. The amusing thing is we get the first introduction of Freak here. Freak, he'll snort anything. I love that they just have to keep driving this home and you'll see it come up again and again that like, wow, this addict will snort damn near anything that's put in front of him. That's crazy for an addict. <laughs> All right, I really like how Freak just launches into his whole life story before May even has a chance to finish a sentence. It's like, oh my god, I've only got three pages to do this thing in. I'm going to tell you everything right now really, really fast. Ah. Oh, also, I'm just going to call money cotton from now on because I really dig that. So it's like, I can't wait till I get my paycheck because I need some more cotton, yo. Harry and the Hollisters by uh, Zeb Wells and Mike Diodato. This is a little thing just focusing on Harry talking to his uh, girlfriend's father, trying to get a mayoral committee formed for him. He's mentioned before that he's done it, so I guess this falls in continuity a little ahead of this. Really good artwork. We get to see a little bit more of Harry, which I like, and uh, we pump up the mayoral subplot, which I'm okay with. Yeah, I thought the Harry story was the strongest of the three by far. It really made me like Harry more, which was nice, and I like Lily's dad. I thought he had some really strong beats there for not really having been introduced to him before. Lily herself, though, just kind of came across as two-dimensional, which was sad. I'm not really seeing what Harry sees in her yet, but I believe in Harry. Another little Harry hint here, it feels like I've been in limbo this whole time. Which, of course, playing off the idea that Mephisto is from Limbo. I'm going to talk more about this and the Mary Jane hints with Jackpot later, but uh, for now, I'll just keep pointing them out. Um, I have somewhat of a long rant on this later, but I'll probably get to that once we do the, the final, final Jackpot reveal. I'm not even sure where that is, because uh, I haven't gotten there, and I think I've read the first four trades. Anyway, I'm sure we'll get there at some point. All right, let's talk about Amazing 549 through 551 by Mark Guggenheim and Salvador LaRocca, or LaRocca, not sure how that's pronounced. Plot points that we get throughout this. Jack gets fired. Oh, God, no, not Jack, I know you're all saying. Jack was my favorite character at the Bugle. Christ, what are we going to do without him? We get the real introduction of Dexter Bennett here, besides just a page or two. He is the ditzy, insane new boss. At least that's how he seems so far. I thought there was a cute little spider ham shout out with Bennett calling Parker Porker there at the beginning. We get a lot more with Jackpot through here. There's this gray goblin guy who's on a glider. We're calling him Menace, and Pete seems really upset that anybody would want to call him a goblin of any sort, even though he obviously is related in some way. We find out that Jackpot's real name is Sarah Eret. We get some more stuff with Lily. Lily is uh, Harry's girlfriend. We get the starting of the um, Spider-Man lawsuit subplot. There's this guy who essentially, like, you know, was in the midst of a fight with where Spider-Man was involved, and he's going to sue him. We get more Betty Brant, though she looks really weird now. We get more with uh, Detective Pallone and the Spidey Tracer Killer, that subplot. And that kind of turns into the entire, like, giant third act, which is Spidey on the run from lots of bad guys, and Jackpot helps him out. And in the end, we get the uh, the mayoral candidate, Paul Free. I can't remember her first name, but she is killed by the Goblin Glider, much like Osborne was killed by his Goblin Glider back in Amazing 121. Happens off screen, which is kind of odd. 
Because it's like, even back in 121, they showed it. I don't know if it's more acceptable because he was a crazy guy in a costume and she's like just some woman running for office or what, but in any case, it happens off screen and you have to just kind of infer that she was killed by the Goblin Glider. To be fair, you do see Parfreeze, Parfreeze, however you say her names, the councilwoman's legs kind of jutting out all immobile and dead-like in a couple of different panels. So, you know, I mean, she's dead. Okay, so here are some issues I want to bring up. There's a lot in the first issue where Spidey is with Jackpot, and he keeps kind of like asking her, your initials wouldn't happen to be MJ, would they? Things like that, very much playing off of the whole uh, tease that Jackpot could be Mary Jane. Here's my thing. Spidey, uh, uh, Peter was engaged to MJ, was really, really close to her, is possibly the only girl he's ever had sex with. I mean, it, it's kind of weird, especially with the revamped continuity, but there never seemed to be a sexual element to him and Gwen. You know, I imagine some heavy petting. I mean, this is a weird area to go into, but for the love of God, like, I, I feel like we have to. It just, it seems as if, like, the Parker luck, which is being shoved down our throats here. With that, he never, like, really follows through with the ladies, but because he was with MJ so long, it seems possible that they have had sex, whereas Gwen, kind of iffy, bordering on the, nah, they probably didn't. So it's like, this is a very, very, very special girl to him. And I know he hasn't seen her in a while, but like, even with the way the continuity works in the Marvel Universe, it's maybe been, what, like six months since he last saw her? So for him to like, be encountering this girl who happens to have red hair and has like a mask that covers a little bit more than her eyes and being like, hey, is that you? I mean, think about it. Think about somebody you're really, really, really close to and were for years. If she came by in like a tiny little face mask, would you be like, who the hell are you? <laughs> it just seems ridiculous. I mean, I know that we as readers, it's not necessarily possible to tell because different artists have different interpretations and we're seeing it from kind of a distance. But for Spidey to be asking if it's her, that just seems weird to me. I mean, is she a freaking clone of MJ that he might mix it up that much? You know, maybe MJ has like a Batman voice for Jackpot. You know, if MJ is Jackpot, you know, something like, hello, tiger, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> and that's why Pete doesn't recognize her. LaRocca seems a bad fit for the artwork in here. I could barely ever tell that it was Peter Parker. Spidey, he's okay with, but Peter Parker was like, ugh, like he just looked wrong. Most of the other characters looked wrong. I like his Dexter Bennett, but Bennett's such a new character that there's no real way to screw him up. All right, I agree with Michael that LaRocca's people aren't necessarily the best. I mean, they're, they're well drawn. I, I I don't know. I just have a couple of issues with them, but I really like a lot of his superhero stuff. I really, really like LaRocca's menace. I, I thought his version of menace was just cool, you know? And I also thought a lot of his action sequencing framing was nice. I mean, not a little bit different, not anything too crazy crazy. I mean, I definitely have seen better, but I have, I liked a lot of this framing, so there is that. We get some more uh, mentions of the uh, Superhero Registration Act, making this feel like it is still part of Marvel's continuity overall, even though there are lots of reasons why it shouldn't fit in, which, like, I don't know where New Avengers was at this point, but Spidey must be a really weird fit in there at this point. In my opinion, Spidey's always been a weird fit for the Avengers. I remember back in the 80s, there was this two-part Avenger story where Spidey ends up going and helping them fight. Oh, I want to say it was Thanos. I swear it was Thanos. And at the end of it, they invite him. They're like, you should be an Avenger. And he's like, wow, this, you know, this cosmic stuff's way over my head and I don't really want to do that. And I was a kid at the time and I was totally like, no, I want to see Spidey in the Avengers because I love him so much. But as I kind of got older, I'm like, really? It's like, I like Spidey. I like the Avengers. They're two great tastes that don't necessarily taste great together. He really doesn't belong in that type of cosmic stuff month in, month out. Now, it's cool to do that occasionally, definitely as a spice, but month in, month out, he doesn't. Wow, I was just totally, totally going off on a tangent there, but the point being is, yes, yeah, Spidey and the Avengers, not so much. Though, it's odd because he works with the Fantastic Four, but that's really weird, and I'm not totally not the place to get into that right now. Spidey, after he learns Jackpot's secret identity, at least her name, keeps calling her Sarah, which makes him come across as a dick. A total dick. I mean, like, if he had revealed himself to Reed Richards, and then every time they were out in the field, Reed's like, hey, Peter, how's it going? Right in front of the owl or something like that. How much of a dick would Reed seem there, right? I mean, it's a secret identity for a reason. So it's like, come on, Spidey, stop being a douche. I want to get into a few more things that Bravort said in his manifesto and kind of compare them to what's going on here. So, oddly enough, because I haven't really liked anything I've seen from Guggenheim before this, this was uh, by far, I thought, the strongest thing that we've seen so far. Except maybe for Zeb Wells' a little three-pager, but more because of the promise that, that showed anyway. I agree that I think this is probably one of the best things that I've read by Guggenheim. The dialogue and plotting wasn't silly or as clumsy as, like, his Civil War Wolverine stuff. Wow, there was no I love corn moments or anything just dumb like that. It did it did have a couple of 
silly moments like Spidey pulling out the binoculars that can see goblin glider exhaust trails that seemed odd that it just came out of nowhere without any type of backstory on him. I'm sure he has them, but I... I Really? He just is like, I forgot I had these in my trunk somewhere. I'm guessing, I'm really guessing that there's supposed to be some sort of type of editorial comment by Wacker there that just somehow got left out. At least that's my hope. I, I overall liked this three-parter and thought that one of the reasons why it really, really worked so well is because more than half of it is Spider-Man as Spider-Man. And I kind of came to realize towards the end of this, I was like, oh, wow, like, this is actually fun to read again because it's just Spidey. Because at this point, Peter Parker is an unlikable loser because Spider-Man's kind of a dick for calling her Sarah all the time. But Peter Parker just comes across as an unlikable loser and I can't relate to him at all anymore, uh, you know, which, of course, is kind of the big problem with Quisada trying to make him more relatable, but we're not paying attention to that. In any case, I just, I don't relate to this character. I don't find him interesting, amusing, or anything. I don't want to read about him. Spidey, however, I do enjoy, and I thought, oh, they're kind of figuring that out, that we have to focus on Spidey, not Peter Parker, because Peter Parker isn't interesting to read, and more importantly, isn't enjoyable to read. Braveheart's, I think his first uh, dictum in his manifesto is, Spider-Man is about Peter Parker, not Spider-Man. <laughs> I don't have anything to say on this except for the fact that maybe they just quickly realized they were wrong. It should be about Peter Parker. Let's put it that way. It should be, but they've ruined him so badly that this makes more sense. And even if you're reading it the way that I want to read it, where it goes from the annual to now, it's like Peter Parker's life is not going to be that interesting unless it's about his kind of potentials panning out. And they aren't doing that. It's more about him getting stonewalled, which again, fit really well in 1968, doesn't fit so well now. Another one of the Brave Ort things that he mentions, one of his kind of sort of halfway rules, is the idea of go forward. Don't play off the same riffs, like he specifically mentions. We don't want a girl falling off a bridge, the whole not another Gwen stereotype, a couple of others that he mentions. Then we have our second storyline end with someone being impaled, possibly, I don't know, beheaded? Who knows what happened to her? Killed by a goblin glider. I'm okay with the new and different goblin, but using this as a kind of dramatic, traumatic moment felt weak. It's like so many other things could have happened to take her out of the picture, but instead she's impaled by a goblin glider and it felt like, hey kids, remember this? That didn't work for me. I didn't have any issues with the glider death, at least not story-wise. Probably for me though, is because it was more focused on the ramifications for Jackpot than it was for Peter. Spidey was just kind of a spectator during that and it wasn't really about him per se, not in the sense of the ramifications. So I was like, I didn't have an issue with that, though I do agree that that did go against Brevort's manifesto on things. Now, mind you, in Brevort's defense, he does say at the very beginning that it is just a set of guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules, but it just seems to be a lot of guidelines they are kind of breaking six issues in. I'm really curious to see somebody who has not read Amazing 121. Did it even make sense to somebody who didn't get the reference? For me, the biggest issue I keep running it up against is that, you know, Spidey is a veteran hero, yet he keeps making these silly rookie mistakes. During the scene at the Councilwoman's death we were just talking about, he even says he's been doing this for a while, and it's like a chess match. He can see how one move leads into another, and I really liked that description. You know, he can see the patterns of a fight. Then he also had those goblin oculars, you know, that he could use to look around to see goblin fumes, showing that he's been around the block a few times. Now, it's just that uh, dichotomy of trying to make him a pro and a schmuck at the same time totally doesn't work for me. I mean, he is either going to be a pro and bad things happen to him, it's the Parker luck, or he's a rookie doing stupid mistakes. You can't have it both ways, and they keep trying to kind of make it that, which frustrates me. Now, that being said, to Guggenheim's credit, I think he actually pulled it off really well in this. He had Spidey run out of webbing, which is a trope we've seen tons of times, but he didn't do it because Parker was silly and forgot to refill it. He did it because Peter didn't have the money to make more, which totally worked for me. I mean, he's down on his luck right now, he doesn't have a steady paying job. He just doesn't have the funds to make the web fluid. So so he wasn't a moron and forgot to refill it. He just didn't make more. That was way more believable to me. So I, I was happy with that. A couple of other quick notes from Brave Ort to just stew about, think about, whatever, simply because they're at the end of this first trade and we've now reached the end of the first trade with uh, stories. Spider-Man is funny. I totally agree. I think he's starting to get funny. I, I, I think Guggenheim is the only one so far who's actually written him so he's funny. Everybody else has been trying but failing, and Guggenheim fails at first because he keeps like having him sing, and it's not very funny, but he he, he gets better as he goes along. It, it picks up, and I think the, uh, the dialogue gets better with Spidey. And his interaction with Jackpot is just awesome. I would be totally fine at this point if, if the uh, comic became Spider-Man and Jackpot. 
He talks about his circle of friends, how Spider-Man used to have the best supporting cast ever. I totally agree. Though I will say that the problem is, it, it's kind of like any sort of ongoing series. The problem is if you ever actually deal with any of the problems that people have, eventually they get fixed. Then what do you do with the character? A lot of people don't seem to know what to do with the characters once they fix their kind of main overarching problem. I mean, if J. Jonah Jameson actually got on like blood pressure medicine, took some Zen lessons and just started like being a normal guy, why the hell would we care about him, right? But if he keeps going like this, his heart should explode and he'll die. So it's kind of, you have this problem where the character works on a short term but doesn't necessarily work on a long term, which is one of the reasons why, and I'll try to curtail these rants because they really don't have a place in this, but just once let me uh, let me go off here, which is one of the reasons why I thought switching over to Ben Riley during the Clone Saga was such a brilliant move, because you got to introduce a whole new cast of characters and deal with them for the next 20 years. I mean, Aunt May and J. Jonah Jameson and Betty Brant and Joe Robertson are great, great, great characters, but you do not necessarily need them forever. It's okay to drop them as long as you bring in other characters, which they are trying to do here. You know, we have Charlie, Lily, Harry, I think, counts at this point because it's, what, been 10 years since he died? Whatever. Uh, Vic and Pallone, which, like, they aren't doing much of them, but, you know, in, in any case, they, they are bringing in new characters. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong here. Yeah, they are trying to bring in new characters, which is nice. Again, we, you know, six issues in, we haven't seen a lot done with them, uh, aside from Lily and a little bit with Carly, and neither of those bits have been too interesting yet. But I am happy they've been bringing in more of them. Also, though, as we've seen with Jonah and, and uh, the Bugle, losing the Bugle, and May add the blood curse feast. You know, they're also trying to do new things with old characters, which I think works for Jameson. So far, it's kind of fallen flat for me for me, but I appreciate they're trying to do it. You know, I don't have, I don't have a problem with them trying this. I appreciate that. Saying that Spider-Man's circle of friends is very important is something very different from saying we have to bring back all those old characters. He talks about wanting the mystery villain, like we had in the old days. The identity of Green Goblin was this big ongoing mystery, and you assumed that it was someone from the cast, unless you were Steve Ditko for a long, long time. Hobgoblin, etc., etc., etc. I did like uh, those parts of the uh, the old series, and I gotta say, I like that they're doing it now. It does feel like they're dropping things, like for instance, this storyline was okay, but what the hell did it have to do with the last storyline? Except for the De Dexter Bennett bits, it felt like it was a completely different Spider-Man universe. But for instance, we have the Goblin Glider guy, Menace. We have Jackpot. I think we have, well, we know Mr. Negative's real name, but we don't really know the story behind that, etc., etc., etc. I find those intriguing. I would like to know more about them. I'm okay with that. I have really fond memories of the Hobgoblin mystery. That was, that was you know, I guess I lied before when I said I came in in the late 80s because I really came in in the early-ish 80s. Yeah, so I have these really, really fond memories of the Hobgoblin storyline and trying to figure out who he is. So I really, really really am digging this whole menace mystery thing. I'm I'm totally happy with that. The spider killer one has potential, but it's not there yet. I'm not frustrated by it, but I, I, I'm not like biting my nails to find out what's going on there. As I've said before, I really dislike this whole like is jackpot MJ thing because I really think it's obvious it's not and it's really silly they keep trying to force it. But aside from that, I'm like, ooh, you know, jackpot told Peter his name, her name was Sarah. And then, you know, he tr Sarah Eckhart. And so he tries to track her down to talk to her and it's not her and ooh, you know, so there is some, there's something intriguing there if they would just kind of focus more on that, I think, than the MJ part of it. But hopefully we're past that and, and we can kind of focus on what I think is the core of, of the jackpot mystery as to who she really is that's not MJ related. One more thing that we maybe won't actually talk about here, but I'll at least bring it up and we'll talk about it next time because I think next storyline it's going to become more impactful to the story so it'll fit better. Or the story after that, something that Brave War talks about is bringing back the web shooters and all the kind of plots that that allowed for. As I say, let's not maybe talk about that at this point, but I think we should all, we, we're all going to agree that that should be talked about. The other thing I want to talk about next time, or possibly the time after that, because we won't have these little Brave things to fall back on, so we'll start talking about some of the bigger issues, is the big question that Jason kept asking, I remember a lot during the first year or so of Brand New Day, when we were mostly just reading kind of plot summations, things like that, finding people's reactions online. I, I think we both lasted at least a year on not reading them. I, I lasted about three and a half years. Jason bought, what was it, like 600? I think that might have been his first foray back. I bought the issues with the Kane, with Kane showing up in the Riley flashbacks because I really wanted to see what they did with Ben Riley. And we'll talk about those, I'm sure, when we get to it. I bought the Fantastic Four two-parter. Yeah, which I got that, and I bought the Omid issues. So the question he kept asking, and one that I think we need to start asking maybe come next time, is could we have done these stories with Spider-Man being married? Like, is there any reason why we had to go through 
one more day to get here. And again, I think that's going to be a bigger issue, and I've got a lot to say on that, but we'll come back to it next time. Yeah, the whole could this have been done with MJ and Peter still being married, it's, yeah, that's going to take some uh, digging into and some time to discuss, so totally up for doing that, though. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. Thank you for listening to Spider-Man Dissembled. And this is Jason Freston saying, have a good day.